All right, um, so let's proceed with uh, balance laws. So last time what we did was cover the mass balance, right? And overall we're going to cover three, the mass balance, the linear momentum balance, and the angular momentum balance. So let me summarize quickly the procedure that we followed for the mass balance because that will dictate also the procedure and the purpose of uh, the, the process that we are going to follow for the momenta balances. Um, so what we did was we defined first of all a overall mass. Okay. We defined an overall, the total mass of the system, and that was the sum of the individual masses of the particles. So this is like a conceptual integral over the body, if you like. Uh, but that is sort of convenient. So what we did was to introduce the density of mass into the system. And I'm going to summarize that over the uh, spatial configuration. So that is the spatial or current density. And then we have a easy integral to evaluate versus this, let's say, conceptual one. So then what we did was we said, well, uh, we're going to invoke the balance law. And in this case, we are, we are assuming a closed system, and we're going to pursue that closed system as well uh, in what will follow. Um, so we said that we are interested in the rate of change of the total mass of the system. And in this case, the balance law is actually a conservation one. Uh, it doesn't change. So that's DDT is what we're interested in. And that's equal to zero, and that is the spatial expression. So this equals zero, the spatial integral expression for the mass balance. But we also wanted to obtain the local form. Okay. And the lo to obtain the local form, we did a trick, and that trick was to pull this integral or express it over the reference configuration. And for that purpose, what I did was replace this infinitesimal volume with the referential counterpart, and immediately that's a map to the reference configuration. And then I can move this time derivative inside, right? Because this is now a domain that doesn't change with time. So I have rho j dot dv, right, equals um, zero. And that allowed me to conclude the eventually the local form rho dot plus rho divergence of v is equal, to the, is equal to zero, okay? It's equal to zero because that's equal to zero, right? So this is the, uh, the spatial integral form, and this is the local or differential spatial or current form, right? Um, and we did the same thing for the referential one as well. So um, in what follows, again, the purpose is the same, to state the integral and the local forms, both in spatial and referential uh, expressions. Uh, but um, what, what it turns out that the momenta uh, laws are naturally expressed in um, the current configuration. And therefore, I'm going to follow a procedure that is somewhat similar to this in the sense that it's also going to be over the uh, current configuration, all right? So let's do that. The procedure is very similar. So the first step, so in the mass balance, we had the concept of a total mass. In this case, we have to understand what we mean by the linear or sometimes called the translational um, momentum of the material. In the spatial configuration. Okay. Um, and that is what I'm going to define as a vector, a calligraphic P, that's a capital P. Um, so that's what I mean. And it corresponds to the sum of the individual momentum of the particles. The individual momentum of a particle is the incremental mass times the velocity of the particle, right? Uh, so we know what it means, but conceptually, let me express it like this, the dP indicating a 
small momentum contribution, linear momentum contribution from a certain particle. So again, that's like an integral or sum over the particles of the body. But again, that's inconvenient, so we express it over the um, spatial or a given configuration, in this case, the spatial configuration. And hence, we introduce the density of momentum into the system. So I'm sorry, let me replace this with a capital P. That's a small momentum of a particle. And the density of the particle, let's denote it with small p. And now I put an integration over the volume. So p is the density of linear momentum within the current configuration. And now we understand what we mean by uh, this expression. This is going to be nothing but rho times the velocity. Okay? And why is that? Because rho dv is the incremental mass times the volume, I'm sorry, times the velocity is the incremental momentum that is associated with a given particle. Okay. So total momentum, sum over the momentum of the particles, density of momentum, and the particular expression. We understand from that. Okay. So that is the final result. All right. Now, that's just, however, an expression. There is no balance law here yet. Okay. Now, similarly, we're going to define also the angular or the rotational. Okay, so these are different expressions that you will see. Or the moment of and I'm going to put just, just quotes there to mean that I'm looking at the angular momentum of the material in the spatial configuration okay, in R. Again, it's a closed system. Okay. But if we want to state the angular momentum, uh, you might remember from your dynamics course that we have to always express the point. Which point are we expressing with it with respect to, right? And so you choose a point, and what is important is that that point should be stationary okay. in the original expression of eventually, um, so, so this is going to be important for the expression of the uh, balance law. Okay. So I choose a stationary point x0, but that's not necessarily the origin. And you define, so let, let me draw this picture, so we have our current configuration, we have a origin, or we're observing everything with respect to an observer. We're interpreting it with respect to an observer. And this is a position of the material point that I'm interested in. And now what you do is you choose an additional point, and that point has position vector x naught. That is the position vector associated with that. And now I define the difference between the two. And I define that to be R naught. Okay? So the notation R in what is going to follow will always indicate a relative position vector. And in this case, relative position with respect to not indicating x naught, with respect to that point, the stationary point that I'm interested in, okay? So this is therefore x minus x naught, okay? Uh, when the time comes, we will remember that expression and make use of that. Um, so now, if we have that definition, right, the object itself, the body is moving, it's just that this point is stationary, and so is, let's say, uh, our observer at this stage. Um, okay, so then the definition of the angular momentum is, so it's calligraphic H, it's a vector, and I put a knot here to indicate that it's a definition with respect to a given uh, special choice of the point. And now, among the alternative names, perhaps the moment of momentum is a very suggestive name. So I'm going to take the moment of the incremental momentum of the particles when I try to calculate the total angular momentum of the body. Moment, with respect to which point? With respect to that point. So the total angular momentum is the moment with respect to that stationary point of the 
incremental momenta of the particles and you sum, if you like, again, conceptually over the um, particles in the body. But now that's inconvenient. And so I want to translate this expression into a volumetric integral, but I've already done that. So I just plug in that expression. So instead of that, I'm going to write integral over the spatial configuration R naught cross rho V dV. So that is the total angular momentum of the object. So now again, that's a definition. There is no balanced law as of yet. Um, so now we want to proceed, based on those definitions, what we mean by a balanced law. And those bring us back to the laws of motion. So we already talked about the mass balance. It is a balanced law that inevitably interacts with the balance of angular and linear momenta. Okay. But eventually, when you want to express the balanced laws for um, the momenta, right? First of all, there are two things. One, they are originally expressed in R. Okay? So I'm originally interested in what happens to the actual physically okay, relevant configuration, which is the current configuration, of the object. I apply a certain force or a moment, and the object will move and deform. Okay? So the, the, the concept naturally resides uh, in the spatial configuration. But not only that, again, I have two possibilities. I have the integral and the spatial one. And I've already, to I've already told you that the integral one is, in a sense, more natural to start with. And we already see that the total momentum is originally, right, that's an integral expression. So now, when you want to eventually express laws of motion for the balanced laws for the momenta, you have two possibilities, the, in the integral one, which happens to come first, and that is due to, apparently, Euler. So that's what we are going to cover first. We're going to state the balance laws um, for the momenta in integral form. And then, of course, our goal is to obtain the local or differential forms. Why? Because those are the expressions that are often, often convenient uh, for numerical implementation. Um, and that's, after all, even if you don't do numerics, that's just an alternative view of the picture. So that's our local uh, second um, goal, the local form or the differential one. And those are due to Cauchy. And that's what we're going to cover next. And there is a natural ordering here because it turns out once you state this, to make the transition from one to two to the laws, local forms proposed by Cauchy, you have to make a conceptual leap. And that conceptual, conceptual leap involves the introduction of a new quantity, which is called the stress <coughs> tensor. The stress tensor does not appear here. It will appear here. Okay? And introduction of that concept is important, and it's in some sense non-trivial. Okay? So first we do that, and then we will take care of the second one. All right. So, well, what happened to Newton's laws of motion? You might remember that in there, you know, if you don't do any fancy modification, Newton's law is a, for a given particle, okay, of, therefore, constant mass. Right? Of course, you can modify it and do something with it, but uh, these are for deformable bodies of arbitrary complexity. So these are more general. Um, so let's start, therefore, with Euler's laws of motion. So what we should understand, therefore, from this is the integral spatial expression of the balance laws. Okay? That's what Euler's laws of motion mean. And the statement goes like this. Now, here I make a very quick reference to, a, to the concept of an observer. I told you that it's important to know how the object is moving, how we are moving. We have to have some knowledge about our absolute motion with respect to, let's say, fixed stars. So in Euler's laws of motion states, states by postulating that there exists a spatial frame of reference, if you like, a spatial observer, with respect to which these laws hold. And if they hold with respect to one observer, with respect to any other observer, you can make a translation of the equations, if you like, right? But first, I need to know that there exists one, and such a frame of reference is called sometimes an inertial or a Newtonian frame of reference. So there exists a frame of reference. Again, you may want to 
read that as an observer. There exists an observer such that, right? So mass balance, my abbreviation was just MB. And I told you for linear momentum balance, I'm going to use LMB for angular momentum balance, AMB. Okay? So linear momentum balance states that the total, the rate of change of the total linear momentum of the body is equal to the force that you apply to the object. Okay? And that is just a normal F. It, 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 it looks uh, deceptively simple. Conceptually, it is simple. And this is the way you have to remember because then I'm going to open up each one of these objects. And if you always remember what they stand for, opening them up, and the way of opening them up is always also similar, then you can expand and always remember what the equations do look like. You don't have to memorize really anything. Right? So rate of change of the total linear momentum is equal to the force, and the rate of change of the total angular momentum with respect to a point x0 is equal to the moment that you apply, the net moment that the object experiences with respect to that point. Okay? Okay? And that's it. Okay? These are Euler's laws of motion. So F is a, the net or the resultant force, okay? And M0 is the net moment about X0. Um, I'm going to introduce an abbreviation for two words, B and S. B stands for body, if you like, volume, and S stands for surface. And the reason I do that is because then we will try to break down these individual right-hand sides. So the left-hand sides, by the way, notice that I already know what they are. I know what it means when I say total linear momentum. I can evaluate its rate of change with respect to time. It's, it involves some effort because it's the rate of change of a integral. If I want to move that derivative inside the integral, it's a spatial integral, I have to be careful. Likewise for that, but I can evaluate it. But as of now, I do not know what, they, what these really stand for. Okay? But now let's think. I'm trying to apply a force to an object, and there are two ways to do that, right? Uh, well, at least two ways, right? So generally, I have an object and I let go of it and it falls because gravity is pulling down. Gravity is applying a force, exerting a force to every particle of the object, right? Um, on the other hand, when it stands like this in equilibrium and this moves, I'm applying a force to the object by interacting with, it, with its surface, okay? So those are the two most general types of, if you like, forces that we can think of. There is a body force and there is a surface force, okay? And these body forces will eventually cause a moment. And the surface ones might eventually also cause a moment. But in general, in general, we can, without thinking about the force, we can think that likewise the moment can be exerted in two ways. To every particle of the body, you can exert a moment. And those sum up to this object. And to, to the particles on the surface, you can apply a moment. And those sum up to this object. Okay? That's just a neat conceptual decomposition. But now let's break down those further, right? So I'm working on the right-hand sides and I'm breaking them down incrementally. Any questions so far, by the way? Okay, so now let's proceed. I am going to work on the left and the right hand sides. Uh, yes? It's a force that directly interacts with the particles, the, all the particles of the object, whether they're on the surface or inside, like gravity. Like gravity, all right? I'm, I'm going to give a further example now, okay? So let's start, FB. Now, eventually my goal is to obtain 
local forms, right? Which means that I want to express things as integrals, okay? Because eventually I'll get rid of the integral sign and be left with a local form. So, so what's the procedure? I have a total quantity. And that means that there are incremental forces that are applied to the particles and the total one is a sum over the particles of the body. And then, that's hard, so I introduce, say, density of that object. In this case, let me call it Fp. So that's Fp is the density of the body force. And now I have a integral over the volume. Whenever I have an integral of the wall volume, you'd like to perhaps also explicitly see the density that you apply per unit mass. And the way to do that, as we've done for the linear momentum, is to say or express this as density times something. And that something is called simply B. And so I am left with rho B dV. And B is called the body force, simply. And it's per unit mass. Um, so now, there is a surface force as well. Again, just always notice how similar the procedure is. So I'm going to now sum over the incremental surface forces, but these are only over the surface, the ones that lie on the surface. And so when I introduce their density, it's going to be a area density. So let us call that T. So now I'm integrating over the boundary of the object. So T stands for the density per unit area, however, of the surface forces that you're applying. Okay? Because it's a surface integral, that's why I have a, sorry, because it's a surface force, that's why I have naturally a surface integral. And because it's a surface integral, it doesn't make sense to break this down into density times something. It just stays as it is. Okay? Now, T is called traction, and it's a very, very important quantity. Remember that nothing I'm writing down in general is a constant. These are spatial quantities. And therefore, this would have an Eulerian expression, and so would this, which would say, for instance, this one will for sure depend on the position you're at within the volume. So it depends on x. And at a given position, it might change with time because B is not necessarily always just something constant like gravity. It could, be, it could be gravity, that's certainly an important one, but it could be a volumetric force such as one you would exert through some electromagnetic phenomena, right? You could have electromagnetic forces, et cetera. Um, what would traction be? It would be, for instance, due to um, contact with a surface. Due to contact with a surface or another object, with or without friction, let's say. Okay. Um, and so if I'd like to, in particular, express the traction. So this is going to be a quick reference to what I've drawn before. When I was talking about what we're trying to analyze, I said, well, we have to have eventually boundary conditions. I'm not going to indicate them, but some people explicitly indicated. So for traction, what we mean diagrammatically is that you apply a force distribution per unit area over the boundary of the object. That could be over the surface of the object. But, uh, so that would be an outer surface. But what we have to keep in mind is that what we call traction is just force per unit area. And we know that if I take a cut within the object and I now look at the, let's say, this portion, and I draw it again, this is now like a free body diagram of the left portion. Now, because I'm taking a cut and there are some other forces and displacement boundary conditions, whatever, so this thing is either in static or dynamic equilibrium, let's say. Um, and so there's going to be a net force exerted on this interface, in, on this cut, okay? It's just a conceptual free body diagram, right? And on the other hand, that force is not applied at a point. It will have a distribution, okay? And I don't know how that distribution exactly is. It might be, let's say, sort of, 
tensile or compressive at certain points. So what we call traction could occur on outer surfaces as well as when you take a cut, it could occur and it does occur at inner surfaces as well. So it's something that actually is occurring all over the body as well. But when we calculate the net force, we're only concerned with the ones that lie on the outside. Why? Because when I bring the object, when I combine the two free body diagrams, these forces will be equal and opposite and they will cancel each other. Only the ones that will, on the outside will remain. Okay. So that is the left-hand side. So now I'm going to express the right-hand side okay, for the moments. Now, the procedure is the same, but there is an important point to mention. So, I'm talking about the total moment, and it has a body and a surface contribution about the reference point x naught. Okay? And now, what I could do, and I'm going to write this and erase it, okay? what I could do is I could say I'm going to introduce a sum of the individual momenta of the angular momenta of the particles within the volume, within the body. And then somehow I could introduce a density of this. I could proceed like that. And certainly it would make sense. Conceptually it is correct. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify that expression. In fact, I'm going to say that the sum of the angular momenta of every particle is of a very, very particular form. I'm sorry, I keep saying angular momentum. I, I wanted to say moment. Okay. So body moments, uh, sum of the body moments on the particles, I'm going to say that they are in a very particular form. In particular, they will be the moment of the forces on the particles. Now, we have to realize that. Maybe I'll come back to it in a second. We have to realize that that is a special assumption. Okay, so I'm going to write the density or the uh, sum of M can be expressed as such. Okay, so sum over the moment of the forces on the particles. And now I want to express that as a volume integral. I've already done that over there. It's going to be integral over the spatial configuration R0 cross rho B dV. Okay. Now, similarly, I'm going to say that M0 of S, right? So the net moment that has to do with the surface is equal to the moment of the f surface forces on the particles. And I've already introduced the density of that, so that simply becomes R0 cross T dA. Now, okay, maybe this is a better time to revisit. Let me revisit this concept very, very quickly, okay? So instead of doing that, what I could have done is something like this. I would introduce the sum over the incremental moments of the particles, okay? And then I could convert that to a volume integral. And I could write M B not D D. Similar to this, right? Similar to the transition from the body to the volume, I could do this. Now, when I look at the force expression, now as soon as I do this, I have some additional quantities, new quantities appearing. Right? I convert this to a density formulation and I have the body force appearing. I convert this to a density uh, over the area, I obtain what's called a traction. When I write these black lines, what I'm not obtaining anything new. This I'm saying eventually is an integral that involves the body force and this eventually is an integral that involves the traction. There is no new quantity appearing. Instead, if I had done the blue, follow the blue line, there would be a new quantity appearing, and I would have to define that. That would, I would say, for instance, say body moment, okay? Something like this, and now we have to figure out what that means and what it stands for. So we're not doing that. Now, that eventually has consequences, and the consequences, the consequences are actually pretty easy. Uh, in our case, following this, these black, li black lines will mean that we are dealing with a so-called nonpolar medium. If you follow the blue line, it's sometimes called eventually a polar medium. 
And what that amounts to in local forms is pretty simple. When we follow our procedure, the black lines, with these special formulations for the moments that you exert to the subject, the stress tensor will come out to be symmetric. Because of the fact that I'm proposing this simple expression for the total moment on the body and on the surface. If I had done something like this, it turns out that the stress tensor does not necessarily have to be symmetric. Okay? So that's a tiny remark that we have to realize. We have to realize that, that this is quite general, but this one is very special. That's geared towards a particular purpose. So now the question of why polar media, in other words, following the blue line and the same for here, why that is important, that's a separate question. But most of the time, in most, most instances, let me say, uh, following a non-polar media, what we're doing is more than sufficient. Okay? And that's what we are going to do. Question. This is the assumption. I'm saying that this has that particular form. So I'm saying that the density of the, let's say, body moment is expressed as the moment of the density of the body force. And in general, it doesn't have to hold. Okay, so that's what I'm assuming. That's the assumption. Yeah, thank you. Well, actually, both, um, right. That's the other. Thanks. Okay, so now once we propose that, actually things are uh, quite nice. Uh, because what I can do is now, I can go back, okay? I can go back to the, uh, to the left board, right? And now I know the left and the right hand sides of both of these expressions. And now I put them together and I present the whole picture to you with the whole assumptions and the definitions that we have made. So therefore, restated. The integral spatial forms of Euler's laws are so linear and angular momentum balance. And if you like, just, just don't write for a second. Let's um, write these together and recall what we mean, right? So on the left-hand side, the rate of change of the total momentum of the object, ddt. And now I have to write the total momentum, r, which is rho v dv, okay? And likewise, the total, the rate of change of the total angular momentum but with respect to a particular point, R not close, cross, so it's the moment of momentum, rho V dV. Those are the left-hand sides. And on the right-hand side, here I will have the total force, total moment. The total force, it will have a volume contribution, and that is introducing the density per unit mass. That's what it is. And then I will have a surface contribution introducing density per unit area. That's what it is, okay? And now I have simply the total moment as, following our assumption, as stated as the integrals of the moments of these forces. So this is going to be integral over the volume, moment of the volumetric force, and the moment of the surface force. So it's nothing to memorize, right? So once you understand what you're talking about, and once you understand how to decompose the quantities into individual pieces, it follows. But what you have to notice, of course, is that this derivative is on the outside of the integral. So, um, so this one, and we will show eventually, this one does not immediately follow from that one. So it looks deceptively Right? It, 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 it's a bit deceptive in the sense that it looks as though, well, I go ahead and put an R naught in here in that equation, R naught, R naught, R naught, and everything, you know, I only immediately obtain that equation. But what you have to remember is that R naught is not a constant. R naught is, right? 
Let me pull up that board, just to remind you. That's what R0 is. It's the position of the point which moves with respect to a fixed point X0. Okay? So when the body moves, R0 changes. And therefore, that thing that goes in as, a, right, as the moment arm, let's say, is actually changing with time. Okay? So that's what we have. Okay? So please go ahead and write that much. All right. So now what we're going to do now is we're, trying to, we're going to try and obtain the local forms of these expressions because now these are Euler laws. Okay? Uh, I've, I've obtained what they are. Um, so they are spatial and they are in integral form. So now let's go ahead and try to obtain the local expressions. In other words, we're going to obtain Cauchy's laws of motion. And what I will do is, in order to make the transition from for, for both this and that, we have to work on them a little bit, and I have to, in particular, introduce the concept of a stress tensor. I will proceed in a way that you see the final results immediately in that lecture, and we're going to fill in the details in the following lecture. Okay? Now, before I proceed with the derivation of the local forms, just notice that these are both balanced laws. They are not yet conservation law. A conservation law would mean that the total linear momentum or the angular momentum is conserved, which means that rate of change has to be equal to zero, and there is only one way. The right-hand sides have to be equal to zero. Okay? So, um, so if um, f or the moment about a point is equal to um, zero, then the total linear or the angular momentum is equal to zero, and you have a conservation law. Okay. Now, another point to make is, well, um, when I stated the angular momentum balance, I chose a particular point, and R0 represents the relative position of the particle in the body with respect to that particular choice of the point. And you might ask yourself, well, what if I had chosen another point? Would everything be the same then? And it turns out that, okay, and that's a homework problem, it turns out that if the linear momentum balance holds for an object, and the angular momentum holds, with respect to a particular choice of that reference point x0, then the angular momentum holds with respect to any other choice of x0. In other words, with respect to that picture, if you show these two, and then if you decide and say, well, I don't want to choose this point, I will choose instead that point, a new x0. And then you can re represent the relative position with respect to that point the equations still hold. In other words, the point that you choose is really arbitrary. Okay? It doesn't influence the outcome. Um, that's something you're going to show in the homework. Right? Um, okay, so therefore, when I draw this picture, you can just, you don't have to worry about how did we choose that point, it doesn't matter. What is important is that this point should be moving, right? Yes? You should be stationary. I'm just checking because some people are nodding, and uh, I, I just want to make sure that people are not sleeping. All right. So what's important is that that point is arbitrary, but it is stationary. OK? All right. Um, OK. So let's proceed with the local forms. Yes, please. Uh, why do we have to show that uh, for an arbitrary r, x0, the linear momentum balance has to, show, has to hold? No, no. What I said, so let me repeat the expression. I told you that in the homework, what you will show is that if the linear momentum holds for the object, it's irrespective of what you're, and if this holds with respect to a particular choice of your point, with respect to any other point as well, it also holds. That's what I said. In other words, the point that you choose is inconsequential. Okay. So let's return to the linear momentum balance and drive the local form. So we have DDT, rate of change of the total linear momentum is equal to 
integral over the volume <coughs> dv plus an integral over the surface. So the same thing once again. So suppose I put all of those terms to one side and I'm able to express the whole thing as an integral of something, right? I put everything to the left-hand side, right-hand side is zero. Suppose I could express everything as an integral over the volume of something equals zero. The only way that's possible for arbitrary choices of R, so in other words, for arbitrary free body diagrams of the whole object, of the whole or parts of it, is if what, what's inside the integral, zero. And that is how we obtain the local form. That's what we did in linear moment, uh, in mass balance. So my goal is to obtain just an integral over the volume and quantities inside it. So the obstruction to that goal is twofold. Here I have the time derivative outside, so I have to move the time derivative inside. That's step number one. And step number two is I have a surface integral here. I have to convert this to somehow a volume integral, okay? Because otherwise I'm stuck, okay? Let's proceed with that one because that is rather simple. And let me do that first. Don't write it. You'll have time to write it. Um, so time derivative over a configuration that is evolving, right? So the trick is to pull this to the reference configuration, R0, right? So I'm converting dV to D capital V, okay? And rho J is nothing but rho0. Okay. Okay. So now I have an integral over the reference configuration. And now I can go ahead and take the time derivative because this integral, the domain of the integral is not changing with time. So it's R naught rho naught V dot D capital V. So I move the derivative, time derivative inside. That's what I have. And now this rho naught DV, right? So actually, it turns out that whenever you have the multiplication of rho times dv, you can switch between r and rho naught simply by rho dv, rho naught d capital V. And what's inside is what it is still, right, vv. And you can move the time derivative inside immediately. Why? Because rho dv is equal to rho j d capital V. And this is equal to rho naught. This is rho naught dv. So now I'm seeing here rho naught dv. I can switch this integral back and obtain r rho v dot dv, okay? So in other words, just as a shortcut, whenever you see rho dv appearing in the integral, you can just move the time derivative into that remaining quantity, in this case, it's simply v, and take the time derivative of that, okay? So that's the result for the left-hand side, and I've achieved my goal for that left-hand side. That was easy. So now I have an integral of something, okay? So integral of something, integral of something, I don't have to worry about that. Now this is what I have to worry about, and this is where Cauchy comes in. So Cauchy observed, first of all, that traction is a quantity, and we're going to now discuss that. I'm just writing what he concluded. And what he concluded was that traction, in this case, it's an Eulerian quantity, is a quantity that depends on position, time, and a surface, remember, has an orientation, an outward unit normal, on the outward unit normal, okay? Um, and he said, in addition to that, he said that the expression is very special. There exists, he said, a tensor, one shows, and we're going to show that, okay? So this is what we will do next time. A tensor that is defined pointwise, multiplying the normal. In other words, mathematically, this thing is a function, a vectorial function of a vectorial quantity. We're saying that it's a linear relationship. And that really, what governs the linear relationship is a tensor. And it's called the stress tensor, Cauchy stress tensor. OK? Um, we're going to show that. Question. It does, it does, but again, we're going to come back to this. You could have an object and traction lives not only on the surface, but on the inside as well. So if I'm at a point, I could take a cut like that, or 
like that or like that. Each of these cuts would have a different normal. So you're at a given position and time, but you can define different normals. Okay? And different surface, it turns out, has different tractions. That's why there is a normal dependence, and that dependence is very special. Okay? So now once we have this, nice, because you can write this as Tn. And what we've seen in our integral laws, integral uh, right, um, equations, expressions, is that we can convert this to an expression over the volume, divergence of T, the stress tensor, dV. And therefore, we have, let me put everything, let me say, to the uh, left-hand side. Okay. So therefore, so integral over R, rho V dot minus rho V minus divergence of T, dV is equal to zero. And this holds for arbitrary portions of the object as well. It always has to hold. Hence, it follows that. And the typical way to state it, it is like this. Divergence of t plus rho v is equal to rho v dot. That's the way I like it at least. Okay? And this is the local spatial form of linear momentum balance. So please write that much. OK, um, so that is the uh, linear momentum balance, local spatial form. Now, we could also revisit, or actually visit for the first time, the uh, integral spatial form of the angular momentum balance and work on that. Right? Within the um, expression for the integral form of the angular momentum balance, there appears the integral over the surface of the moment of the traction. That is the trick integral. But well, now we know that traction is expressible in this special form. We could go ahead and analyze that expression in detail. And what we would obtain is, so again, this is to be proven. It's to be proved, to be shown as well. OK, that one um, is simply that T transpose is equal to T. And that is the local spatial form of the angular momentum balance. In fact, what I will do next time is I'm going to start with uh, that expression or I'm going to start with the derivation of that expression uh, based on this knowledge. Right? Uh, and then we're going to leave to the very last discussion of that expression and why it implies this particular form. Okay, we'll make that derivation. And it's called the Cauchy process. That was the contribution of Cauchy. So let me summarize, therefore, uh, what we have overall as the spatial forms of linear momentum and angular momentum balance laws. Right? So I'm, I want to make a table that is similar to what we've done for the mass balance. I have the integral formulation in this case called um, Euler's laws of motion. And then we have also Cauchy laws of motion, which are the local forms. And we have the expression for linear momentum balance and angular momentum balance. Okay. Uh, the integral forms, I've already written them down. <coughs> integral over the boundary, traction d8. So that's the surface force, integral over the volume rho b dv, that's the volume force or the body force, and that gives rise to rate of change of the total 
linear momentum of the object. And the angular momentum with respect to a given reference point x naught, that would be the moment of the surface and the body forces. And that's equal to the rate of change of the moment of linear momentum. Okay. And the local expressions now are, for the lower one, it's very simple. T transpose is equal to T is all that is implied. Uh, whereas term by term, this eventually contributes to divergence of T. The second one is already in integral form. It's simply rho v, and after we move the time derivative inside carefully, we obtain rho v dot, which is the acceleration at a point. Right. I'm sorry, there's a tiny mistake here. Uh, this one? No. Uh, to summarize the spatial forms. To summarize the spatial, spatial. in other words, the uh, current configuration, right, R. And so we call the current configuration or the spatial or the deformed configuration. Okay. Why do we say the local spatial? Uh, oh, okay, right. Why do we explicitly say spatial? Because Eventually, I will have the integral and the local forms of the balance laws for the referential configuration, stated over the referential configuration. So each of these boxes will have their counterparts when instead of the spatial configuration, I invoke the reference configuration. Okay? So, but to make that leap, first I have to Show, show you where the stress tensor comes from and how we obtain this particular form, et cetera. And after we settle all of that, that we're going to pull these concepts, these objects to the reference configuration, okay? And uh, so, so to give you a, uh, let me say a short um, um, hint, what's going to happen is remember when we stated, for instance, the mass balance over the reference configuration, we had to introduce the concept of a referential density. So there was the counterpart of rho in the reference configuration. Okay? Uh, therefore, what's eventually going to happen is that there is going to be a counterpart of the stress tensor also in the reference configuration. This is a very particular stress tensor. It's called the Cauchy stress tensor. So it turns out that just like the strain, right? There were multiple definitions of strain, but they all had certain desirable properties. Similarly, there are different definitions for the stress, different expressions, uh, and they live on, let's say, different configurations. Uh, but they all have certain desirable properties, and they can all be, in some sense, related to the concept of strain. So that's going to be the subject of the lecture that will follow the next one.